Welcome to Sausage on a Fork, a podcast dedicated to the UK's longest-running children's drama programme, Grange Hill. My name's Neil, and in each episode, I'll interview a former cast member about their life before, during and after their time on the programme. Okay, welcome to the latest episode of Sausage on a Fork, and I am absolutely delighted to say that I have been joined for this episode by none other than John Pickard, who played Neil Simpson. John, welcome to Sausage on a Fork. Oh, mate, thanks for getting me on. Yeah, I know we've uh, we've struggled over the last couple of months to get it happening, but um, I'm just glad we've we've got round to it today. So thank you for having me. Oh, brilliant! Yeah, it it, it has been it's it's been a long time coming. As an yeah. this one. So, well, what we'll do, John, is we'll start this episode the way we start every episode. And if you can tell us how you first got into acting. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I went to a stage school, to be honest with you, um, called Silver Youngs. And um, we used to have various sort of open castings. And, and sometimes we're having like an affiliate agency attached to the school. Uh-huh. We're still doing our like, you know, curriculum stuff. But we had a vocational side and an agency. So they sometimes bring in directors and I think it was producer Albert Barber and a director called John Smith came into the school right. and we did some, um, we did some sort of, I think we might have even that to do like, a, we used to do Lambda exams, monologues and things like that. I think they got a few of us to do some sort of Lambda exams in front uh-huh. of the directors. And then maybe it progressed to, a, it gave it gave us a scene um, with no context to who we might be playing or right, yeah. where we might end up uh, around 1989, 90. So yeah. So yeah. Um, and then off the back of that, there may, might have been a recall and then got, got offered the part of Neil, right. Neil Timson. So that was it, really. It was based off of them coming into school for open yeah. auditions. And, then, and and that was how it often worked back in the day. You just get, get get called in or get a casting brief, get sent somewhere in the West End or whatever. And then you'd go off and yeah. I guess a kid you're not really thinking about. You're thinking it's part of the school, you know. So yeah. one of those ones. Yeah. yeah but like, but before getting to you were like, you were pretty sort of, you were working quite a bit because I seem to remember seeing you in like advert, different adverts for stuff and, and things yeah, like that. I did, a lot, I did a lot as a kid. I mean, it, it all dried up when I was about 21, but that's <laughs> another story. But, uh, <laughs> but um, basically, yeah, like just working as a kid, really. I worked from the age of five. I mean, I was like a like a, a, a child labour, you know what I mean? I was yeah. there <laughs> there I, I think I had, such a, I had such good rapport with the guy from the Kensington and Chelsea um Child licensing department. I used to run out of base coffee. <laughs> never have enough time, but um, missed a lot of school. But you know, like with Green Chill, we'll probably come onto it. But there was obviously tutors there, yeah. and you get pulled out and stuff like that. So I did, I did get my education more as one on one basis. But yeah. um, you know, as a child growing up in that kind of environment, it is something like it's a little bit, a little bit different. Yeah. And did you get to work with any sort of big names in them early days? Um trying to think it there was like uh there was some big names i can't even i can't remember obviously doing 2.4 i work with a lot of big yeah, names yeah, yeah. like stalwarts from the bbc and obviously the stalwarts from gray and chill that was still there 20 30 years later yeah. you know your robsons and they'd all have massive careers over the years as well yeah this is my room what was her name anna um anna quail Quayle, I mean, she had a great career. Lots of people like that working in Great Chill. Yeah. Um, I think when you're young, you don't know who anyone is anyway. Yeah. So you still go as well. So a lot of the times I, was, I found that later on in life, you know. Yeah. But I noticed here, like when I was looking through sort of what you've done, there was a thing called One for the Lifeboat. Which That's is like right, yeah. Thing. And Jeff Rawl was in that. Yeah, you, obviously. Jeff Silas yeah. and Holly, oh, do you get what the thing with later on? Yeah. Absolutely. I bumped into him recently in, in the <laughs> outside of fish shop in, um, in Richmond. So that was funny. Yeah. But like we got, obviously my brother worked with him more in Hollywood. Yeah. Jeff was back in that. Cause that was before Grain Shield, but that was an amazing piece that, uh, I was funny enough. I was talking about that job to my mum the other day. I was saying I cried my eyes out. I had this tutor there that I didn't like. I was <laughs> crying. I, I had to go on the train on my birthday, my 10th birthday, and then down to Anglesey in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was, um, you know, it was a, it was a good one, but I think there was a scene in that run for the life boat where I had to cry, and it was literally real tears. I was just, I was homesick. <laughs> right. Yeah, Fair play. All right, so that, we, we'll move on then to Rachel. Yeah, you, you said like you know you, you you've gone through your audition process and stuff, and and were you a fan of Rachel at the time? I think so. Yeah, I remember like coming home every night and watching it after screen. You know the old comic book strip opening. Time yeah, yeah. <laughs> always resonated with me so yeah was definitely a fan and 
obviously the Zamo and all of that, the uh, the, the highlight kind of biggest uh-huh. audience was it thirty mil that just say no campaign yeah. and all of that. So, I mean, that was huge, wasn't it, back in the day? So I was, yeah, yeah I was a fan. Yeah, definitely. Brilliant. So what was it like going from like being a fan to suddenly being with these people? I mean, presumably, you know, you were at Sylvia Young, so you would yeah. have known quite a few of them anyway. But was it strange, sort of going? All of a sudden, being like, I'm, I'm in this environment with them now. I think so. Yeah, I mean, what was quite nice about it was that kind of camaraderie. I think as a, as a a new like year group coming in, I think we were called R One or something with that. And I knew a lot of kids from school from Silvers as well, be it uh-huh. on the um, Saturday school or all new cast members, and still some I speak to today. Yeah, um, yeah. So that was that was a nice environment because we're going in as like a new set of kids. We were all kind of learning the ropes together. And, and I think even then we had rehearsals and things like that. So it was a real like getting on the bus from school, going to school, getting in and out of one uniform into the other. So yeah. it was, it, although it was felt like you were part of something, it also felt like you was being initiated into something new as well. So that yeah. with with friends and people that you know from school and Saturdays. So it wasn't too uh, too kind of like fandom. But, um, but yeah, definitely felt it was part of something quite cool, you know, like in the yeah. you know, new regime, if you like. Yeah, so so you started in series thirteen, which went on air in nineteen ninety, and you were playing Neil Simpson. Yeah, and the very first scene we see you in, um, you were stood by the school gates with another lad who we later found out was Neil's brother Barry, played by uh, Crane. David Crane. Yeah. Um, what was your relationship like with with, with David? Yeah, great. You know, he, he was a it was a nice you know nice dynamic between us because he had that kind of you know he'd been there been at the school. It's always nice when you start a new school. Yeah, and you got your older brother there. It gives you a bit of clout, doesn't <laughs> it? So um, I think that was a, that was a nice nice way to play on stuff. And he had a bit of a reputation, so obviously we we did. But um, but yeah. It was great. David was lovely. Yeah, funny enough, I knew his sister from Sylvia Youngs as well. Oh yeah, yeah, day. yes, because yeah. she was in. She was in Grange Hill as well. Later, that's yeah, right. Yeah. There was a lot of that, as, you, as you'll as you find out as we go along, I'm sure of that, yeah. you know, with Julie, Julie Buckfield, Claire Buckfield, we was all we was all from Sylvia Young's, a lot of us yeah. as well. So you had that cool. dynamic. We had that yeah. kind of... And, and, and like I say, the, the, the pair of them were stood there and it was almost like they were surveying the, the, the playground for, for victims yeah. as they were looking around. And, that's right. And, and two of the girls were then uh, heard talking about Neil Simpson being in the school. Yeah. And how he'd be twice, he'd be twice as bad in this school because his brother Barry was there in the second year <laughs> right. as well. Yeah. And then there's a bit where Neil and Barry are arguing with Julie Corrigan because I don't know if you remember this one, Jacko's dog had got into the school. That's right. Um, Played and, by Margot Selby, wasn't it? Margot yeah, Selby. Yeah, Margot Selby, Selby. Yeah, yeah, Julie, yeah. yeah. And the dog had followed them to school and Julie had caught the dog, but the Simpsons were claiming it was their dog. Uh, right, you know, yeah. uh, as they would. Yeah. And more of the girls came to the dog's rescue and let it go. And then Jacko and his mates came looking for the dog and Neil sent them the wrong way. Now, yeah. what I liked about about Neil's character was the fact that he was meant to be like this bully, this hard lad, but he was yeah. tiny compared to... <laughs> Squeakiest voice ever. <laughs> like, like you, you, you'd wonder how... Such a little kid had such clout, you know, yeah. like around the school, and and, and so have that arrogance and, and swagger about yeah. it. Like, and I just think it's brilliant because you know, obviously, my name's Neil, and I was tiny at school. He was almost like right. the, the exact opposite to me <laughs> in, in some way. Small like, man syndrome, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Small dog, small man. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. So, like, Neil sent Jacko the wrong way, and the girls then the girls told Julie that they should she shouldn't have argued with. At Simpsons, because Neil wasn't just nasty; yeah. he was pure evil, basically. Wow. Like, I mean, he must have been a great character to play. Yeah, it was good fun. I mean, it got, I got up to all kinds of stuff, you know, like uh, putting the uh, what was it called? Like putting the cling film on the toilet yeah, seat, yeah. <laughs> spiking food, and all sorts of stuff, you know. And like, but you know what? Like bullies, if you really look at them, they're, they're sort of it's to take the attention off them, and it? it's like yeah. that thing. Bullies are. 
the psychology of it all is that they're not really that tough when you stand up to them. Do you know what I mean? But yeah. um, looking at the, but it's always nice that you've got an agenda, haven't you? It makes yeah. school life more interesting when you've uh, got someone to pick on. Yeah. 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 So Jack O then came and asked Neil what he'd been doing to the to the dog, and Neil replied with nothing. I wouldn't do to you. There you <laughs> <go>. <laughs> yeah, quite strong. And like like you've just said there, you know the the, the cling film. On the on the toilet, there it was when um, Neil took Julie's again, picking on Julie, getting her sandwiches off it, give the sandwiches That's to right. Barry, and Barry just took the cling film, threw the sandwiches away, and put the the cling film on, on the toilet. An absolute classic, classic yep. prank. <laughs> and but uh, Barry got two of the lads to stand at the urinals, yeah, and then got uh, and him, him and Neil went in, into the toilet, so there was only one toilet left, and it, it was Loho who came in and the inevitable happened, basically. Yeah. Um, but what what I love about that scene is the fact that Barry's told those two lads to stand at the urinals. Yeah, yeah. And then when, when it's all happened and gone, like, there's another scene and it goes back to those two lads stood in the, still standing there at the <laughs> urinals. Like, Are we allowed to move yet? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they were very under the cosh. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And then you mentioned about Anna, Anna Quayle. Um, yeah, man, I mean, she must have been just like, and because she is, she was a legend, you know what I mean. So yeah, it absolutely. must have been, it must have been great getting to work with her as well. I was like tour de force as well, wasn't she? You yeah, know, and a great character as well. She had that real, like, you know, you were scared of her, didn't matter who you were, type of thing. Yeah. But um, she was no nonsense, wasn't she? But um, but yeah, lovely lady as well. Very, like, yeah. very nice lady. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, and then there's a bit where Neil, being Neil, had forgotten his PE kit. And but so were Brian. Um, right. So Jacko had to take his dog home again, and he gave his pee kit to Brian. But Neil said, "Well, you know, I want it. I, I, I want it. I want to use it." And Jacko was like, "Well, yeah, you might want it, but you're not having it. I'm giving it to Brian." And Neil said that he would regret that. Now there was a lot of sort of clashing scenes with Jacko and Brian and Locke. But what was your relationship like with those lads? Yeah, good. I mean, like Ian Steele and Otis Munyangeri, yeah. and obviously, God, God rest uh, Jamie Lahane as well. But um, uh -huh. yeah, again, we had that banter, you know, like it was that, it was good. It was like three versus one or three versus two with my brother as yeah. well. So yeah, it was it was nice to have that challenge. You always need that in any conflict, don't you? You need the, you know, you're the one that's kind of the outsider, but um, standing up for yourself. But they were good yeah. lads as well. I mean, they had some really great storylines. And I thought that was a really a nice dynamic between those three. And um uh -huh. You know, I suppose having that tight unit, something that probably Neil wanted to be part of, you know, mm -hmm. really deep down. And uh, and one way to uh, infiltrate is to cause it cause some trouble, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. It was good. It was good. Always nice to work with them guys, always. Brilliant, brilliant. Now, I don't know if you remember this. There was a game that they played called Satellite. Right. And it involved holding yeah. hands in a line. Oh, I do remember this. Yeah, and yeah. spinning around in a circle. And... Again, it was like Neil and Barry basically press ganging people into playing, come and, come and do this, come and do this. And yeah. Neil was on the end, and as he spun round, and he he, he knocked into a, a key and, and knocked great. him over and started laughing. So, yeah, Jacko and his mates ran over to sort of like defend the key and, uh, and, and protect him. And then, and Neil came out with like like a racial slur. I'm not like, okay. I, I'm not going to say what it was, but yeah. You, you think you know you think about that like and this is what Green Deal did. It, it shocked people, didn't it? Because it was yeah. quite shocking to hear. Because it's not like they weren't sugarcoating the words in in, in any way. Like, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's kind of groundbreaking in everything that it tackled. Um, in, in that regard. And, you know, like you could argue, look, what well, 30 years later and you're still having these arguments even today. So yeah. I don't think in drama you should shy away from anything that's happening in real life. I feel that's really important because, uh -huh. you know, like comedy or drama, if you, if you dilute it so much where everyone's so scared of saying anything, you don't have any conflict, you've got no drama. So you have yeah. to, you have to t tackle things that are going on because it raises, brings up conversations and have, you have debates about it, whether that character's right or not, what, what, what their unconscious bias is, which we all have that we need to yeah. think about in life because it can play out in real life and having conversations about stuff is, is in drama, especially is, is a, is a starter of a conversation uh -huh. and hopefully it can make you realize that's not the way to behave or, but it, you can't say it doesn't happen in real life. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Definitely. And, 
and, and so because of this, when, when, when this happened in the story, Jacko and his mates were determined to get the Simpsons back. Yeah. For what for what Neil had said, even though Akeek was like, "Well, I've, I've heard it all before," it you know. Yeah. So the next day, when they were do, they were playing satellites again. Jacko and his mates ran over to them with a net. Do you remember that a net that they'd got from the gym, and okay. and, and, and wrapped the lads up and started batting in the yeah. middle. And then there's a bit where the lads were playing football with a tennis ball, um, right. and Neil tried to kick it away. But failed miserably. So all the lads are all laughing at him. And Neil, Neil vowed to get revenge on them. So what he did was, I don't know if you remember, it was a story with a video nasty. Vaguely, yeah. So he had a video nasty called Ninja Demon, was the name of the uh, name of the video. And he basically he put the case on Mrs. Munro's desk. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. And put then put the video in Jacko's bag. Right. So when Mrs. Munro found the found the case. She was asking whose it was. And everyone knew it was Neil's, but no one was going to say anything. Yeah. Um, so then it was... Becky had seen Neil put the tape in Jacko's bag. So she suggested... She said, Miss, why don't you check the bags? Why don't you check everyone's bag? And kept saying, check the bags. I'm looking at Jacko. So Jacko realised. But Neil being Neil when he saw Jacko, Miss, he's got it. Like, you know, <laughs> would, wouldn't let anyone tell on him, but didn't mind telling yeah. on anyone himself. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> Mrs. Munro went to Jacko, but it, unbeknownst to Neil in that time, Jacko had managed to pass the videotape. It had gone all the way around and ended up back in in Neil's bag. So, he he was then caught with it, with Mrs. Yeah. Munro and given a detention. But what I liked then, what that led to was then Mrs. Munro talking to Neil in the detention. And we found out a little bit more about him because she was speaking to him and he was saying that, like, he, he often stayed up late. He was able to yeah. watch whatever he wants, whatever he wanted on, on the telly. His mum worked in a pub. She, she was working at night, so it wasn't really su- very surprising the fact that he was he turned out sort of the way he had. And, and I just thought that was, it was good because you got to see like a bit more about him and the fact that, you know, not always, but kids that have got that sort of home life can turn out. Of course, like yeah. That. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a valid point and a nice, like you say, insight into the character, what's going on at home and a, a chance to, because often you, you, you're unruly kids. They are, they're probably underparented, you know, and, and sometimes, like you say, not for any fault of the parents apart from trying to put a bit of food on the table, you know, she's probably out grafting until late yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, and he's got his brother there. So, um, but yeah, you know getting onto the wrong channels is probably more current today with the, the kind of scope on YouTube and everything else where uh-huh. you do have to manage it a bit more because of what you what you can see out there at a click of a button is probably more dangerous than the videos that happened 30 years ago yeah. to a degree. You know what I mean? But um but yeah I think it's a nice insight like like you mentioned and, and the storyline um was it probably would be better if he had a bit more of a firm hand at home or uh-huh. a bit more care and love you know what i mean because it often yeah. goes out the window from no fault of the parents sometimes they're just trying to do what they can yeah yeah and there was a bit where there'd been hunger lunches in the school and i think you might have mentioned this earlier on where right. um that the, the children could donate money to right. charity in return for a ration lunch um, and some of the first years decided to make a load of chili con carne to oh, sell okay. because People were still hungry after they had their, their hunger lunch. But right. obviously, the lads weren't going to tell Neil what was going on. But Neil worked. Neil wanted him. He, um, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. can you remember what he did? I think you might have mentioned it I earlier on. He spiked on. the food, right? He spiked it, no? With well, some extra chili that, or something. That, so, he put a whole tub of chili powder yeah. <laughs> in, 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 into the, into the yeah. pan that they were making it with. And when they come to sell it, there was uh, Barry and his mate Lee sort of pushed away to the front and demanded free food from them. And yeah. while they were doing this, again, Mrs. Munro turned up again because she found out what was going on. And one of the girls who was there complained that it was too hot. So Mrs. Munro made sure that Barry and Lee got big portions of the chili con carne. All oh, right, yeah, yeah. And then said that Neil should have some as well. Now, we didn't actually see anyone eating it, but can you remember if that, if that scene was actually filled? Um, I don't know if it was, but you can imagine the uh, really <laughs> what you showed 
finale episode of them in uh, yeah. you know, the toilets. <laughs> you know, the and yeah. then the, the Timpsons were determined to get the lads back. Yeah. So they brought in some laxatives. Ah, okay, yeah. yeah. Right? And at lunchtime, the Timpsons offered Brian and Locko some hot chocolate with the laxatives in under a pretense of a peace offering, basically. But Maul and McCall saw what was going on. So told Mrs. Munro, because he wanted to be on. Mr. Hargreaves had that vigilante committee, so Mauler wanted to be on it. So Mrs. Munro asked Barry to drink the hot chocolate instead. And that was <laughs> another foil plan. He didn't have much luck, did he? You know? No, did not know. <laughs> Rinse and repeat, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and there's another bit where they're going around saying people had nits. The Simpsons were walking around. you got nits and marking people with chalk on their back. Oh, with, a big, big with a big capital N on the back, yeah. Mm. And Mrs. Munro was doing a lesson on the Black Death and rats and head lice. Yeah. Saying head lice lived in a clean, clean place. And then she says the line, and I love this line, unlike some rats, stand up, Neil Timpson. <laughs> like, Bloody hell. You missed um, a trick. If you no. want to. And then she told the class that she had it when she was little and that... Neil should write a big letter N on her back. And she gave him the chalk to do it. And he's about to do it until she then says, but you shouldn't because you have no idea what would happen to you. <laughs> and then she once again talked about rats, giving Neil the eye. And the last sort of big thing in, in that in that series was bullying a key into doing homework. Right, yeah. So the lads said to Keith, do it, do it. Because they had, they got some disappearing ink from Mr. Hankin. So, <laughs> that, you know, as, as, as you do as in you school. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So then, when Mr. When Neil gave the homework in to Mrs. Munro, it obviously wasn't there. Yeah. Um, so then we move on to series 40, which went on here in 1991. And then this one, Mr. Van der Groot had joined the school. He introduced himself, said he was from Holland. And Neil stood up, looking him up and down. And Mr. Van de Groot said, what's the matter? He said, why aren't you wearing clogs? <laughs> <laughs> and there's a bit where there was radio-controlled car day. Oh, I remember those, yeah, yeah. So it seemed to go on for quite a bit. There was a bit with the, the radio-controlled cars. We were in quite a few yeah. episodes. And the Timpsons had the car, and they were racing for money. And it was a, like a real, like, souped up. Car, you know, they were never going to lose. But then Richard and Tegs and Matthew came running around the corner, and the Simpsons ran off, leaving the car behind because the car was actually Richard's, and <laughs> and and they nicked it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Neil seemed to have made amends with some of the lads when they were protesting against the size of the school dinners, mm. and he was deliberately taking his time choosing what he wanted and kept asking for things that weren't there just to, you know, just to, to, to get on the wrong side of the people that were in charge of doing the, the school meals. But then you start thinking that maybe he is changing his ways and, you know, he is coming around to what the other people are doing. But then he didn't. <laughs> he wasn't at all because in that same episode, he was the first person to pay the rent on the lockers when that, that was introduced. And in the locker, he was keeping a Keeks radio control car <laughs> that that daddy'd nicked from him, and Neil sold the key. Daddy'd have a look around for him, and find the car if he uh, if if a key gave him three pounds. A key then told Mrs. Munro that his car was missing, and she said they would search the school for it. And Neil sort of had a bit of a panic here, and he faked being sick so that he could go to get the car out of the lockers, and he put it out onto the playground. And I don't know if you can remember what happened to the to the the car. When he took it Did outside, it squashed? yeah, it was squashed by yeah. a truck, yeah. Um, that, yeah. And Neil seemed really happy about it getting squashed. But when he went back to class, he told Mr. Munro he was now feeling a lot better. And then he took the car to a key and told a key that he should still give him the money because he told him he'd find the car, <laughs> <laughs> even though it was wrecked, he, he, he should still have to buy him. And the girls have been picking on Julie. There was a, quite a bit of a storyline there where Julie yeah. Corrigan had been getting bullied by the girls. And, and she sort of bunked, was bunking off school and 
Neil basically told the girls, yeah, well, she's going to do that. If you keep bullying her, you're going to have to find someone else to pick on. Now, so he did have sort of like that side to him. Like, yeah. you know, and, and Becky turned around and says to him, well, you know what you are, don't you? And Neil just says, he just comes back with, well, that makes two of us, doesn't it? And this happened quite a bit in Grange Hill. You know, we've talked about them trying to sell chili con carne at lunchtime. At, in this one, they were selling pizzas. I don't know if you remember. Oh, yeah. Jacko and his mates have been selling pizzas. Yeah. And Neil and his mates ran after them to nick the money, but were stopped by Mr. Hargreaves, who then made them uh, clean the playground. Foiled again. And they... The pizza business was booming and Jacko and Locko had to clean up the art room this, this lunch time to mess about. Even though Neil was involved, he managed to get away with it this time. And Neil and Barry told Trevor Cleaver, because the lads were selling the pizzas for Trevor, and they, sold, oh, yeah. they, they, they told Trevor that he should have got them to do it. The pizzas turned up late and Trevor had to sell them cheaper. But for some reason, Trevor then put ketchup in Neil's bag. Um, yeah. But Neil blamed Jacko, so him, <laughs> him and Barry painted the pizzas red. I don't even remember that one. Vaguely, yeah. So, so they couldn't be sold. Like, and I mentioned Mr. Van der Groot earlier, played by William Brand. Now Neil did this classic thing, like when someone turns up, when you're a kid and someone turns up from another place, yeah. and you've heard of someone from that place, you ask them if they know them. Neil asked. Mr. Van der Groot, if he knew Rude Hullet. Yeah. Because he was Dutch. So Mr. Van der Groot then says, well, do you personally know Paul Gascoigne? And Neil was like, well, why should I know him? And he said, well, he's English, isn't he? And Neil, do you remember what Neil's answer was to this? No. He says, no, he's not English. He's from Newcastle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, we talked about the radio controlled cars, but then there was a boat race as well. Right, um, wow. And Neil and Barry obviously ran a book on it. And they were thought they were going to win. They thought they were going to clean up on it. because, But Steam Machine, the outsider, that everyone had backed, won. Meaning yeah. that they had to pay up. They tried to run off, but were caught. And had to give all their money back. And going back to the pizzas, Jacko and Locko had gone to visit Brian in hospital. Don't you remember that storyline? It was like yeah, cancer, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there was the, that, that storyline, the leukemia storyline. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So they'd gone to see him in hospital. So they asked um, Julia and Keith to sell the pizza. Why they asked them to? I don't know. You know what I mean? So the Simpsons tried to muscle in again, but this time Julie refused to budge on this one and kicked them out. Showed a bit of fight in it. And, and kicked them out. And then Neil was then volu volunteered by Mrs. Munro again to clean the lockers out and throw all the rubbish away. But he started putting all the rubbish in the bottle bank just before the bottle bank was collected. And he'd put, he had Barry's CD player. I don't even remember yeah. that. And he put they, Barry's yeah. CD player down. And the bottle bank was, after it had been empty, after it had been collected, the new one was put down. Right, on, top yeah. of, on top of the CD player. And Neil couldn't remember what he'd done with it. And they go looking for the CD player in the lockers, but they get caught by Mr. Hargreaves, who then accuses right. them of like being on the rob, basically, and, and, and stealing stuff. So they go to his office, and they have to empty their pockets out. And he said he wouldn't call the police, but he was going to write to their parents. Now, the only reason I'm mentioning this scene, it doesn't sound like it's much... Yeah. There's not many blooper reels from Grange Hill available, right? But there is a blooper reel of that scene. Oh, really? It's on, yeah. It is on YouTube. And well, what happens is, when Mr. Hargreaves tell him to get this stuff, put it back in the pockets, as you're putting stuff in your pocket, you drop a load of money. And you just, <laughs> it's brilliant because you just say, keep the change. And walk out because <laughs> you've stopped all that money. Keep the change yeah. and walk out. And like I say, really, it's it's it, it's so much better than you watch. I I'm not doing yeah. it justice. By, I'm, by, I'm, by, I'm, I'm gonna try and find that one. I'm gonna like say, yeah. yeah. And because of that, the Simpsons were then banned from the end of the same disco, but phoned the fire brigade saying that there was a fire at Grange oh, Hill. Yeah. And that was the last we saw of Neil Simpson. Wow. That's um, 
what a history of it all. I mean, like such entrepreneurial spirit, <laughs> yeah. also, like, uh, you know, quite fun as well. Do you know? What yeah. I mean? There's all this stuff going on, probably better than the classes that were going on behind the scenes. You know, like, like, I, like you, you got to work with like some of like you know, big names there. You know, that's the likes of like Trevor Cleaver and you know, you've mentioned you know Jacko and and Mauler was there and, and Mister yeah. Argy, Mister Robson, or all, all people like that. But why did you leave? It's a strange one that because I um. After those two years, I think 2.4 came around. Right. So I was probably auditioning at a similar time. Uh -huh. um, and I think I either made a decision, it was one or the other. I don't think I could accommodate two. Right. So I think it was just a bit of a, it was a big decision, actually. Um, but I chose that route. And I, yeah, it, the history is what it is now. Yeah. I definitely remember it being a big decision. My mum was like, you've got to do one or the other. And um and I chose the way I did, yeah. But it was it was a tough one. Would have been nice to look back and go, I did a bit more because it was obviously yeah. just on it on the up with all those stories you just mentioned. But uh -huh. I think just as a kid, what would I have been there? Eleven, twelve? Yeah. Do you want to do this or this? I remember lo loving having having to miss a lot of stuff doing Grain Chill because it was obviously 10, 12, month, 11 months of the year. Right. Uh, some personal things, and I think maybe as a kid, I just thought, oh, I want to try and do some of that as well. Yeah. So. I think the de decision was always down to me. And I remember, actually, my drama teacher at Sylvia Young's, um, Jackie Stoker, when I first got Grain Chill, I got the part of um, Puck with Sir Peter Hall in Glyndebourne. Oh, right. And it was a very prestigious, uh, you know, yeah. production to play a great part in a Shakespeare classic. And I had to choose either that or Grain Chill. So I think wow. I had to make another decision very early on in Grain Chill, which was 2.4. So I went down that road and, uh, you know, Funny enough, I knew the actor that ended up doing the Glyme Bourne piece, but it's um funny when you look back, you don't really know the decisions you're making and what impact, yeah. what kind of actor, what life would I have had if I'd have gone down that route yeah. as well. Um, I'm glad I've chose all my decisions. Yeah, you know, oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. It would have been nice to have done some more, yeah, definitely, if I, I would, could have fit in. Yeah, I mean, the thing with that was, as well, like the strange thing was, they kept Barry Simpson yeah. in, yeah. But, there was, but there was no mention of Neil ever again. Well, yeah. yeah. He, not even that he got uh, suspended or something. You know, there was nothing. It was, it was like yeah. Barry was there. Well, obviously, he had his own, you know, his own story like that. It was just there. Yeah. It was today. Okay, so let me move on then from Grange Hill. I've got The Ghost of Oxford Street. Wow, yeah. With some massive, massive music legends in that. And yeah. you, you played young Malcolm. So I'm assuming that's Malcolm McLaren. That's right, it? yeah. Right. So he was he was the you know big manager wasn't he uh, yeah back in the day and um, it was this homage to sort of uh, Oliver Twist and I think I did this sort of weird haunting spooky voice but I think Sinead O'Connor was in it Tom Jones yeah there was loads was it the Pogues or uh -huh. um, yeah it was so we, I remember shooting on a roof in Oxford Street opposite Marble Arch so he would tell some ghostly stories about what actually went on behind the scenes, kind of like when people do these sort of Jack the Ripper yeah. experiences that still go on today. And he was sort of telling this, and he obviously had a fascination with it all, with these music musical interludes. But I do remember having to go into a top recording studio with him and do this weird whispered version of, uh, I don't know, an Artful Dodger-esque piece. Right. But yeah, great. I had this mad wig on of some mad orange wig because he had like... Yeah, yeah, he had mad hair, didn't he? Yeah. Orange curly, curly hair, but... Um, I think the mad thing, I remember sharing a taxi with him because for whatever reason, he lived in Labbert Grove at the time and I did too. He lived down on Oxford Gardens. So I remember getting in a car with him. We went off to set and it was a late shoot as well because it was filming like like at midnight or something down in uh -huh. Marble Arch on the roof there. Yeah, yeah, it was a mad, mad, mad piece. Was he like, and you know, you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but was he as eccentric as he comes across? Yeah, definitely. Life, right, okay. yeah, 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 100%. <laughs> Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, so we'll move on then to two point four children, which was obviously like you know it was a, it was huge, wasn't it? Two point four children. Yeah, it was yeah, massive. massive. And you played David Point, David Porter, so you were obviously like a principal character there. Yeah, obviously you worked with Claire Buckfield on that and Tim yeah. Benson, you know, Rachel Star Wars. But that program had comedy legends all over it. Yeah, as well, didn't it? Like, yeah, I mean, definitely. you know, like your Liz Smiths and Roger Lloyd Pax, obviously Gary and Belinda speak for themselves, Julia Hills, yeah. and uh, a great entourage, and, and loads of episodic visiting characters that have been in everything over the years on BBC, and especially in those 90 sitcoms era. 
where yeah. you just had like you know name after name. You often had a guest lead in every episode. Um, but yeah, it was it was a, it was a it was a great piece to be a part of, and um, you know, uh, yeah, it, it ran its time. Obviously, sadly, sadly, Gary passed, which uh -huh. was a really tough one. But um, you know, because that was my ex where I had the, the talked earlier. I had the extended family at school. You know, I'd have one school, and then yeah. I'd go to school and have like this dual relationship with a second school with Grange Hill. You know, that was my second family, if you like. I was I was working for these people with big chunks of time and had this other life and this other family. So that was yeah. great. You know, great experience growing up on that, and uh, we had a lot of fun. Yeah, a lot of fun. Uh, uh, presumably, at that time, you must have got recognised absolutely everywhere you went. Well, yeah, I was thinking about this today, like, you know, like how how it's changed. But, you know, that time there was only like four or five channels yeah. on. I think I can't remember when uh, Channel 5 came along, but it was after that. You know, we had 14 million views, Series 3. So that's a lot of the that yeah. was a share of the audience, the TV audiences. Yeah. When you look back to like some of the biggest of all time, I think it was EastEnders 1980, but like in Grain Chill, whatever it got. But 14 was big. So I was, yeah. I was heavily recognised and... Being a kid as well, like I had to still go to school and get on the bus coming home and passing the certain schools that were yeah. looked out for us, having to run for me life a few times. But uh, but yeah, you know, it was it was it was it was an enjoyable one. It was a, definitely a different one. I had a lot of um, a lot of fame and uh, attention growing up. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was it was it was kind of mad, really. And I, I had a good family at home as well. Like I lived yeah. in pubs, grew up in pubs, so. I had a very grounding uh, life growing up as well. Right. Very real, very kind of, you know, as real as it gets, I suppose. Yeah. So, um, now, yeah. now, whenever I'm putting an episode of the podcast out, I always put picture clues online as who the guest is going to be. And the yeah. first person that guesses who it's going to be gets to ask a question to the next guest. So okay. I've, got, I've got a question for you here from someone called David Smith. And he says, obviously, you played a teenager in Grange Hill. And you yeah. played a teenager in 2.4 children. Yeah. Which of those two characters most closely resembled you as a teenager? Probably probably Neil, to be honest with you. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. We had two brothers, you know, we was always out running and climbing the streets and playing about. <laughs> you know, my mum my lived in a pub, you know, we lived in pubs uh -huh. and stuff. It was probably the closest to uh, David, uh, to, as to Neil at that time, yeah. Right. Um you know, we was a bit troublesome. We was uh, looked out for ourselves, and we was always up to no good. So yeah, yeah. yeah it was cool. When you repeat some <laughs> of those lines, it was up to some of those shenanigans. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Now you just mentioned yeah, your brother there, obviously Nick. Now I, yeah. I, I love that coincidence. It's one of those things that I've always loved that, that not coincidence, but that sort of parallel. Yeah. The fact that you and Claire were in yeah. two point four children at the same time, Nick and Julie Buckfield were in were in Hollyoaks. But yeah. um, I've been told that you'd known each other way before then. Well, yeah, because of Sylvia's, basically, yeah. we all went to school together. So there was this kind of mad crossover with Claire and I and obviously Nick and uh, Julie. Yeah. But um, but goes back to like doing school shows with Sylvia Young's theatre school productions and things like that. So we knew each other from back then as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so it's mad. It's kind of incestuous, really, isn't it? Like, yeah. then got boyfriend and girlfriend, and then um, we were brother and sister. But funny enough, Claire and I got to work together in a play called um, Time of My Life like, right. quite a few years after, and only for a week in like Croydon or somewhere. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and we got to play like husband and wife. It was really right. mad. <laughs> yeah. Pushing Brilliant. the boundaries. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. And then you made that, that well travelled path from Grange Hill to Albert Square. Where you were, uh, well, it says you did 26 episodes of uh, EastEnders there. Like, yeah. you remember that though? It felt, felt like about five or six because, again, uh, what you spoke earlier about the decision to do 2.4 uh -huh. and uh, over Green Chill. But I think what happened at the time, EastEnders were offering more, me more, but I still had some commitments with other things like 2.4. And I, I don't think I could do both. Right. So I think that's when I stuck with 2.4. I would have liked to have gone on a bit more of a journey with that character as well, with um, uh -huh. with Kevin, because he was kind of a bit of a Robbie's mate, really. That was all he was known as. But it would have been nice to explore where that went and who his family were and all of that growing up. Yeah. Who, yeah. Who, who knows? Yeah. And then you did, you did one episode of Sunburn, 
Sunburn was a banana yeah. program. It was brilliant, but it was it was a mad program, wasn't it? About the uh, yeah. the holiday reps, wasn't it? Sunburn. That's right. Yeah, all set in different cities around different resorts around the around yeah. Europe. We yeah. had a couple of weeks in Greece. Yeah, um, it was good. Paphos, that was it. Paphos, we filmed it. Um, yeah, it was good. I think we were lottery winners or something. I can't really right. remember. To be honest. And then, person. quite similarly to Sunbird, was Mile High. Yeah. Well. <laughs> um, Jack, yeah. Jack, yeah. That was a, yeah. another one there. Because I remember when Mile High, Mile High was like really sort of heavily like advertised and promoted. And so that's why yeah. I remember that. Like, and I certainly remember watching it. But well, it was we, sort of that, the same company did Dream Team, so that was a big right. drop show yeah. for uh, why. So it was the same company that made that. I think it made two, two or three seasons, but yeah, that was it. Was good fun to do, like yeah. traveling around a bit and stuff like that. Yeah, playing Literally. cabin crew. Yeah, so I mean, did you actually go to like? Yeah, we, did. To build, right? we did. Yeah, I remember filming. It was always in the winter, uh, right. and pretending it was summer, and so you'd have people <laughs> yeah. in, the and they say, "Could you pull that person out because they've gone blue?" <laughs> Supposed to be having a good time in the swimming pool. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. And then, then we move on then to Hollyoaks. And you played Dominic in that. And you played Tony Hutchinson's brother. <laughs> yeah. Quite surprisingly. One episode, it was like, you know, we're brothers. Yeah, cliffhanger. But um, it was weird because obviously Nick had done Hollyoaks for, what, maybe 15 years at that point. Uh-huh. I thought they, they would probably never ask. Um, right. At, up to whatever. I don't even know if he had a brother. Obviously, he didn't in his story backstory, so they invented one. But um, it was great to spend time with Nick up, up in Liverpool and obviously work together and we had some good times. It was about five years I did. So, yeah, yeah. it was good. Oh, this might be yeah. a daft question. Yeah. But did you have to audition for that part? I didn't actually, no. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. I mean, I basically, for a wedding, there was an old producer there called Joe, uh, Joe Hallows before change from Mersey TV to Lime. There was a big changeover. I think it was one of her like last things she did. Right. I went to a wedding. Obviously, we was all dressed up and we had a good time. And um, I think I got the call quite soon after that. It was Nick, quite close to Nick's 30th birthday. So, right. yeah. So, yeah. And then I got a straight offer. Come and start Hollyoaks. It was quite mad. 2015, I think it was. Yeah. yeah. When Hollyoaks first started, I remember seeing Nick on Italian. and I thought, he doesn't half look like that lad who was in Green Jill. Uh, yeah. no, yeah. And then, then obviously you, you realise you put two and two together or you were actually brothers. Like. Well, funny enough, a lot of people think we were the same actor as well. There's a lot of people think right. we're twin, twins or even like, you know, like did this with the same actor doing the really? same part. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Oh, brilliant. I think oh. even on my Wikipedia, there's a picture of him, you know, how people can tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tremendous. Tremendous. I'd like it. Must, it must have been great. Getting to work with him. him it was him. great. We had some good times. Nice storylines. You know, I, I'm a bit biased, but I think Hollyoaks was at some of its strongest time at one point. I think we won the Super Bowls for the yeah, first yeah. time. There was definitely a period in that where I think the show was uh, had a nice blend of old and young characters, but good families, good storylines. And I, I, I still think it was some of the strongest times Hollyoaks ever yeah. been at that time. Not because um, I was in it, but just because of what was going on and uh, and how it was run, you know. And you're yeah. at the book. And the McQueens were brilliant. Like, McQueens, uh, the, McDean storylines, all yeah, of that. They, they were brilliant. I, 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 yeah. that, when, when I saw that first core, initial core of the McQueens, I, I loved that. I loved them when yeah. they were in it. Brilliant. brilliant. Okay. You've done Casualty and Birds of a Feather. Now, I need to ask you about Birds of a Feather. Yeah. Because it says that you did one episode and it was only your voice. That's uh, right. Yeah. It was a very strange one. We, we, we rehearsed all week. And it was it had a feature in these two noisy neighbours next door, but you never got to see them. So you, we were literally just there doing the voiceover. So you, were, yeah. So you were the, the noisy neighbours. Now, can I ask, were you the type of couple that were always arguing, or were you the type of couple that got on really, really well? I think we was always arguing. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because I've, I've, I've had neighbours. I've had noisy neighbours in the past. Some of them didn't get on, but some of them got on really well. And you're like, this, this, this is too much. This thing. So. I just thought yeah. that uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd definitely. Well, it's hard. Isn't it? I, I live in a flat now, and you know, if you don't get good neighbours, it is it is a strain. So. Yeah. But they yeah. were lovely, actually. To be honest with you, the whole team there at Birdsworth Feather, obviously, they've been going forever as well. And uh, what a lovely! It was a great week, actually. Because that was a, that's a, another a huge for like you know yeah. for, for 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 you're not being featured as well. So it's quite strange. Yeah, I mean, it's another huge comedy, a new, new huge sitcom, yeah. isn't it? Like Birds with Feather. Okay. So, can I ask you then, what what do you do now? 
I'm, I'm a producer now for a production company in um, in London called Bear Jam, and we make a lot of like um, a lot of content for brands, really, a lot of talking heads, ad uh-huh. campaigns, sizzles for you know for social media, um, quite a lot of kind of high end sort of throwaway content where you're sort of it's attached to a brand or a brand campaign with a call to action, and, and a lot of that. Um, I got into this side really whilst being an actor. And filling in the gap so initially working as a first assistant because i've stood on that side of the camera a yeah. first assistant director is one that kind of manages the day and i think actors are quite good at that because you're still on that side waiting for it to happen yeah. and to to sort of run it from the other side uh, and then i got into producing by raising money for films and then i sort of produced a couple of films and started my own little indie yeah. and just just wanting to create content really just to stay in the game um I did five plays in 2015 after I did like a casualty episode. I went and did like this sort of short Shakespeare, new bit of writing. And then after these five plays, I really had a moment of like going, I think I was on 970 minimum wage. It was well for the Shakespeare for six weeks and I had no money. And I was like, I need to do something else. Yeah. I made, I started making some content and off the back of that, we pitched to channel four and I made a documentary for them, but purely just to stay in the game into some level of like creative inspiration um but i have hung up my acting boots for a while since 2016 i, I did a short film two scenes in a short film for a mate mainly because i was teaching at the time acting i was like i don't want to turn into one of these people that teach it that never do it yeah so i kind of had these two scenes and i went i oh, taught these kids in the morning and then i drove down to this set and did these two scenes film was quite nice actually but you know I, I keep saying to myself and to acting people that acting really, you know, there's no real time frame on it. I could have a career if I'm alive, God willing, in, in my 70s and, and start again because I've got different life and ex- life experiences. Uh-huh. So as long as I want to do it, it's just like at that particular moment, I did these five plays and I was like, OK, I've come out the soaps where you don't always get to flex the, the muscles of acting that you want to do. And then I came out and went and did these plays and it was all very different genres, Shakespeare, Chekhov, new writing. And I was like, I just, I, yeah, I just felt like my heart was filled for that moment. I yeah. didn't need to keep on kind of jumping on that hamster wheel of like casting and, and the insecurities of not having any money um, of just like what, where the next meal's coming from. Although it didn't get better for seven years as a freelancer, as a, a creative, but you you kind of, you're doing it yourself, you know? Yeah. It's not yeah. someone else's decision. But who who's to know? The truth is I fell out of love with it a little bit. Mm-hmm. Am I itching to get back into it a little bit? I have been thinking about it more lately. I've got an agent, but, you know, it's just, it's time for me. It's like I've got yeah. a daughter now um, and I'm just, you know, I, I could bring something else to the parts that I play now because I'm I physically am, different you know a bit fatter bolder um <laughs> I'll be you, know, like, <laughs> you know but the thing is as well like i could I, i'm a you know those life experiences you can never be the same again after having a kid like you've just changed like yeah. that moment when she was born is like so different so it's like that alone to be able to have that gravitas i could play a dad now you know yeah. um but we'll see you know i i just for now i'm i parked it i'm loving what i do i have a very most of my projects now producing a very kind of four to six week life cycle. So the kind of fast, intense periods where and I'm producing stuff. It's quite nice to you get this project, which is on a bit of paper. And then in the end, it becomes a video and a project or a, a series of films. And yeah, you know, I'm just trying to create. And I did a, a screenwriting MA. So I need to use that a bit more. But it's just time, mate. Everything's yeah. time. But uh, I, I think the good thing with acting, I would say, is time is on my side, hopefully. God willing, and then uh, you know I'll, I'll act again. It's just for now I, I parked it, and it's been ten years now, so I need to get back on that horse. I'm not scared of it. I just um, just parked it at that time, you know, and it's felt right. Yeah. Would, uh, can I ask which which do you prefer? Do you know what I love? A, I love a fringe play. If I'm honest with you, I love that. You know that immediate um, yeah. plays different every night. Yeah. But that kind of instant gratification. You know, small venue where it's intimate. You walking over people's legs you know what i mean it's like yeah. and the play's there you can't beat that you can't beat that feeling um you know the chekhovs and all of that the shakespeare they do stretch you in a different way i've done four or five shakespeare's now i think the last one i played was sir toby belch he was a lot of fun yeah. that big drunk character you know <laughs> um, but yeah it was good yeah it was good fun fun enough I, i'd always wanted to get into these big establishments like the national and all of that and we had ellie nunn Right. Play, uh, play. I can't remember the lead, uh, one of the lead characters anyway. But Trevor Nunn came to this little tiny venue above under the Leicester Square Theatre. Yeah. 
tick your own boxes in your own way. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and none saw it a couple of times. So I thought, there you go. There's a Shakespeare legend. Yeah. He saw Shakespeare. So there you go. Yeah. Um, and, and like you've said, uh, that it must be great getting that sort of the immediate reaction as well. From, 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 you can't from. Beat it. Yeah. And the, the difficulty with um, any kind of media format is i think judy dench once said it is that moment is bottled and it's kind of that's the only way whereas actually there's a million ways to play things always but yeah. it's like that is shaped due to time and you know it's just it's bottled and, and that moment's always bottled whereas actually in theater that moment can keep, keep expanding keep evolving and be different actually to yeah. a degree every night yeah. yeah brilliant brilliant okay you mentioned this earlier on like can, but can i ask are you still in touch with anyone from Grangeil. Um, funny enough, Sean Carnegie, he had some smaller parts in it, right. but we still speak every now and then. Um, obviously, Claire was in Grangeil. Yeah. I still speak to her from time to time. We've we've met up a few times. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, I think I might have, uh, Sean, Sean Maguire I bumped into a few times. Oh, yeah. yeah. Same with um, uh, uh, Rachel Robertson as well. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you know, like it's, it's one of those sort of moments where you're like you're kind of family sheds a moment in time and that always lives on whenever you yeah. bump into people again you know what i mean so oh otis yeah. as well Muni and gary oh, yeah. i've yeah. seen him a few times Brilliant. Uh, yeah quality quality yeah. times okay well we are coming towards the end of the interview john yeah. and i've got the same few questions that i always ask everyone at the end yeah. of every episode so sort of in the last couple of years there's been talk of a Grain Jill movie in the works. You know, Phil Redmond's written it and you know there's other people on board with writing yeah. and, and producing. But what do you think of the idea of a Grain Jill movie? I think it would be quite interesting. I've always thought about a um a film idea or a premise of a show that that starts off in some sort of reunion. Uh-huh. And you then drip back into people's lives, or people kind of rekindle things. But yeah, be interested to see how he could take it. I think there's, a, I, I think it could run. I don't know how how long and where he would take it, but it's talk about a film at the moment. I think yeah. in the format, isn't it? It's a movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So be, it's just who do you pick in that those time frames, and what characters do you do yeah. you kindle and go back with? But, could start at the beginning. We could, who closed it? Was it uh, Mark? So there was uh, Todd Carty. Oh, Carty. Yeah, he, he's So would it be Todd's character? Because he's kind of infamous yeah. with Frank Jill, isn't he? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But but if you were asked, would we see a return of Neil Timpson? Yeah, definitely. Why not? <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. So you've said earlier on that you watched Grey Jill when you were younger. So other than Neil Timpson, who was your favourite character in Grey Jill? I like Tegs, to be honest. Tegs and Justine's storylines, yeah. I think they were really strong. I used to like uh, John Orford's character as well, Robbo, yeah. and yeah. Uh, Ian Condon Lee's character. Yeah. Those Ted. lads. Yeah. They had some really? good stuff going on. But your teachers as well, your Robson's, uh, Stuart Robson's character and um, Mrs. Munro and Mr. Hargreaves, I think they were yeah. really great uh, characters. And obviously the Zamo drug storyline, uh-huh. as much as it, uh, you know, like how strong an audience it was, but I think it was really resonant like powerful storylines that yeah you know still resonate today and i think like that's why in a lot of phil redmond shows that's why they still linger because they they tackled taboo subjects and and hit the hard stuff as well as much as yeah. the fun stuff yeah, yeah. so it, and if you couldn't have played neil was there another character who you would have liked to have played yeah probably would have liked to have been in the jacko loco and uh... <laughs> That gang, Brian. Yeah, they had a good little thing going on. That would have been fun. I think I might have read from them one of those as well. It was funny oh, right. how, yeah. how, you all, how you were given scenes and, and then they were patching you off with different character groups. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, you, you've mentioned this a, a little bit already, yeah, but, but the final question, John, is why do you think there is still such affection for Grange Hill? Probably nostalgia, right? We yeah. all like look back on our childhoods and uh, and good times, and I, I do think we have warm feelings towards shows like that because it had part of your childhood growing up, and it was aspirational, and it was after school, and it was a switch off. It was, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was, you know, probably when you had more of a central focus of, of content, and it's not so split now. Like people don't watch TV in the way they used to, yeah. but got so much choice now sometimes it I, I flick through stuff and i don't know what to watch it overwhelms me where yeah. maybe it was a bit more 
a bit yeah. more streamlined in, 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 in how we, um, what we wanted to watch and what we were given to watch and of its time, you know, it's interesting, isn't it, that we'd want to go to school all day and come home and watch stuff about <laughs> yeah. uh, But, you know, there you go. Brilliant. Well, John, thank you so much for coming on. It's thank been, you. It's been thank great. Thank you for persevering as well. I know <laughs> Spoke over the times, but uh, and congratulations! Weren't you nominated for an award recently? Yeah, so I'm up for um, well, it's the Listeners' Choice Awards on in the British Podcast Awards. So anyone that's yeah. listening, thanks for reminding me on that one, John. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, well done, mate. Well done. It, it, clo- it, it, it yeah, closes yeah. on the 29th of August. So if you can go to BritishPodcastAwards.com yeah. forward slash voting and make sure you vote for Sausage Order Four and verify your email address. All the stuff I keep telling you on social media and on here. But no, John, honestly, it's been great. Thank you so much for coming on. And thank and you for having me, mate. Your time, thank your you for your insight into all the tech took you on a journey there. It was really yeah, fun. no, yeah. no, it's, it's it's been great listening to your experience, not just on Green Hill, but on the industry as a whole as well. It, it's been really great speaking to you. So thank, thank you, you once again. And to anyone that's listening, I'll speak to you next time. Cheers. Yeah. Thanks. Nice Bye-bye. day, mate. Take care, yeah. Bye-bye.